so so this is our first physics seminar for this semester and uh, since we're doing uh uh i mean we're, we're doing zoom because of the virus so uh and uh, it's our great pleasure to have a uh, mr raf layton today with us and uh raf is a uh, uh, author editor and educator and uh, he got his uh, master degree in uh, uh, California State University uh, in education. And uh, he actually, uh, he was a close friend of uh, Feynman and uh, they they played bango together and then uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, had tons of adventure, I guess. And uh, so today we're, he's, the, the topic is, uh, his topic is uh, Richard Feynman, a curious uh, character. So uh, I know for you guys, some of you may, may heard about Feynman already and some of you may not know him at, at all. So what we're gonna do is here is we're gonna start from a brief introduction. I'm gonna give a brief introduction of Feynman and then we'll uh, turn to Raf and then uh, ask him questions about Feynman and he can share whatever uh, he wants with us. So let me start from sharing my screen here. Okay, so this is the, the talk. Uh, the, can you guys see my screen? Okay, good. Uh, so yes, or hold on, let me. Okay, good. Okay, how? Okay, so let let's let's start it. Okay, so uh, it's a very brief introduction uh, of uh, Feynman. So basically, uh, Feynman was born 1918. Uh, this is what he looks like when he was really young. And he, uh, he has a sister like uh, 10 years, about nine or 10 years old, younger than him. His dad was a uh, salesman uh, in New York. And then uh, he, his dad taught, uh, taught him how to uh, explore uh, science and uh, uh, think independently and also uh, try to uh, make sense of those uh, abstract figures and numbers. And uh, he's, he learned the uh, humor of, about life, of life from his mom. And then he went to, uh, he was very, he liked science a lot. He had a lab at home and then he, he was repair radios. He studied like uh, trigonometry and calculus by himself and everything. And then he went to MIT uh, for his uh, bachelor and then uh, Princeton for his uh, PhD. He got his PhD degree in 1948, uh, 42, uh, when he was only like 24 years old. And then he, he's taught, his research, his work was really important that uh, in his first talk uh, in seminar, Albert Einstein, Wolfgang Pauli, and bunch of uh, gent in physics, physics attended, and then they are interested in his work. And then he got married with uh, his uh, high school sweetheart, Arline uh, Greenbaum, and uh, she was diagnosed with uh, uh, diseases, uh, tuberculosis, and then uh, he Feynman knew it, but he, he really loved her, her, so they got married anyway. And then she died, I think, a couple years later. But they had a great time. And, uh, and then uh, Feynman joined the, the Manhattan Project in 1943 after he uh, graduated from Princeton. And he, he was famous for uh, his calculation ability there. He had, he lead a team there for human computers. They call it human computers because they use a bunch of people to, to pass through those IBM uh, uh, cars for computation. Uh, and, uh, and also he was famous for uh, safe uh, cracking at, at that time for uh, at his spare time. And then after uh, World War II, he, he got a position at Cornell uh, in the uh, age of uh, like uh, 27. He was so young at that time and a lot of people would recognize him as a student, not a professor. And then he joined uh, Caltech in 1950s. And this is what he, uh, he, when he gave the uh, famous uh, Feynman lectures in the early 1960s. And then he got Nobel Prize with uh, uh, Schringer and uh, Tomonaga in 1965 for his work in uh, quantum uh, electrodynamics. And, uh, and he got married again uh, in, uh, during that time and he got two kids, a son and daughter. And there's a nice picture of them in Mexico, uh, 1978. And, uh, and also he, he was famous for uh, uh, joining the member of the Rogers Commission to investigate space shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986. And he did a very famous uh, demonstration on TV in public by showing out uh, uh, the old ring, which is a rubber ring 
I keep putting the O-ring into the ice water and then took it out. And then he showed that the O-ring kind of lost its elasticity. So this could be the critical thing that uh, caused the disaster of the space shuttle. So, and then he died uh, 1988 after long battle with cancer. And uh, that, that's his life. So uh, I want to also talk a little bit about uh, what, what is the good about it. So first of all, the Galarian physicist, so obviously he's a great physicist of World War II. Uh, his famous work, including quantum electrodynamics, which is a starting point and the critical uh, part of the standard model. And he got a Nobel Prize for it. And then if you open any books in quantum field theory, you'll see a bunch of these kind of things like Feynman diagram, Feynman propagator, Feynman gate, et cetera, et cetera. Like I showed one, this is the one that diam Feynman diagram will look like. So it kind of becomes an essential tool for any physicist working in this field. And he also worked, uh, another very important work is passive formalism of quantum mechanics, which turns out to be also very useful in quantum field theory, especially for quantizing uh, gauge field. And, uh, and then he did part of model of strong interaction. And then he tried to quantize a uh, gravitational field, but not successful, but this is still an open question now. Nobody has been successful in doing that. And he, he also did a bunch of other works uh, and including you know, the concept of quantum computing and nanotechnology. So I think he's famous for his original way of thinking and strong calculation ability. And he has profound knowledge in almost every branch of theoretical physics, which can be seen from his publication and meetings by his colleagues and uh, visitors. So he, he, he's, he's enjoy, enjoy, enjoying mostly his pleasure in science. Uh, he, what he's, I, I, this is a couple of uh, a sentences I, I got, I took from a, a foreword of a, the, a book called Feynman Letters. Uh, he's actually a, a guy that prefer clarity uh, versus, uh, rather than uh, profundity and then questions uh, versus answers. And he loved, I mean, he, he doesn't, he's not bothered by the, uh, he does not know something, but uh, he feel like the ignorance uh, is actually a good starting point for any scientific research. And uh, he feel like this is actually the bad, I mean, the, the, the merit of science instead of the, uh, and also he emphasized scientific integrity a lot, uh, according to this uh, 1974 Caltech commencement address. And uh, he talked about, in that address, he talked about his integrity to, uh, to one himself and also to the integrity to other people, to the public, to everybody. In the end of the talk, he said, uh, I wish you could have this integrity, you know, uh, good luck to have this freedom, you know, to uh, this kind of integrity, so that you don't have to uh, keep uh, to to keep and ma maintain your position in the organization, or et cetera, et cetera, to lose your integrity. And actually, he actually did, did something uh, along this line himself. He actually resigned from National Academy of Science in 1960s. Uh, I was a little bit surprised when I read that, but uh, his reason for that is he he feel like uncomfortable of judging other people's uh, merit, you know, assess other people. And then he refused, be refused bench of honorary uh, degrees as well. So that's how he kept his own uh, integrity. And uh, he also had the passion to educate. He, he's famous for this demystified, sophisticated ideas in physics. Uh, he, he said that what one fool can understand, another can as well. So basically he's uh, it, it shown by a bunch of his uh, uh, publications like Feynman Lectures in Physics, like Feynman and Hugo's Lectures, The Corrector of Physical Law, and then QED, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter. So it's all fun to read, and even for a uh, undergraduate student, you know, like a freshman. And uh, he's, he's, he has, he shows a lot of curiosity and adventure in all kinds of uh, territories, which I have no time to include anything, but just show some examples. Here's uh, his drawing, one of his drawings. He actually, he learned how to draw himself, and then he, this is his drawing of his hero, uh, Paul Dirac, and he's also trying to crack uh, the Maya code. And also here, so he, he, he played bango a lot with uh, the uh, speaker today, uh, Ralph Layton. And also the, here is uh, his last journey to uh, Cuba, uh, also partly uh, I mean, uh, with uh, uh, Ralph Layton. So, so that's my introduction, quick introduction to uh, Feynman. And uh, with that, I, will, I can turn to Ralph Rap, do you have any comments or uh, anything you want to add on to the introduction I gave? Sorry, Rap, we, we cannot, I cannot hear you. Uh, okay, there we okay, go. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes, forgot to unmute myself. 
that was a great introduction, better than I could have done because I don't know how to summarize <laughs> such a big life. Um, for me, he was a friend and a drumming partner primarily, but as we were drumming, we would take breaks from time to time and then he would tell stories in between. And a friend of mine, fellow drummer, and I would listen to these stories. We were a generation below him. He was at around 50 when we met him. And we were in our teens, uh, almost 20. And so to hear somebody telling us stories uh, about what it was like to uh, be on the atomic bomb project and cracking safes and, and um, doing things that uh, got the military upset, like uh, there's this whole story of censorship. You, you, uh, you, know, you have to show the military what you're um, writing letters you know, to, to people and you have to show them and you can't send codes, but he liked codes. Anyway, there's all kinds of stories that he told. And I realized pretty soon that uh, these are fantastic stories, but I can't retell them. I mean, I just proved that right now. I can't retell the story. So I asked him if uh, I could record it on tape and then maybe transcribe them and write them up. And uh, so he agreed to that because no one had done that yet. And he was getting, you know, 50 middle age and nobody had written down these stories before. So I started doing that and it took uh, uh, another oh, 10, 15 years before I finished that. Um, but that is what resulted in the books, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, and What Do You Care What Other People Think? So anyway, it was through drumming that this all started. And if I can, I wanna try to uh, show you a little bit what the drumming was like. And my wife sure. is in the other room running stuff. Uh, Phoebe, you wanna try number five? She can share the screen and let's see if number five will work to give you an idea. Even if you don't hear it very well, look at the expressions on Feynman's face while he's drumming. Uh, there's something I wanna talk about with that. So Phoebe's gonna share her screen. Okay. So the sound was not working. Uh, it's not working very well. But uh, yeah, but we can see the uh, the video. So. Okay. Okay. So. So yeah. So. Uh, do you? Do you that want... <laughs> that, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Great. So that gives you an idea of what our relationship was like. It was mostly drumming, mm -hmm. uh, and stories on the side. But you could see from the kind of crazed expressions you know, on his face yeah. that uh, he almost looked like a madman at that time. And uh, I was almost in a trance myself. You could sort of see me you know, kind of going like this, right? Yeah. And the drumming 
kind of does that to you. You, you, you leave your body and you go into a different state. And this gave me a clue about Feynman. Uh, he liked to get out of his body with his mind and go into a different state. You may know that he liked to float in uh, a, a, um, a tank. They're called sensory deprivation tanks. And they fill it with salt water at your body temperature. And you lie in there and it's all closed and it's dark. Mm -hmm. And you try to feel like you're, you're leaving your body and you're wandering, you know. And he loved to do that. And I learned later uh, when we were trying to reach this mysterious lost land of Tanu Tuva that Tuva had shamans. And what do shamans do? They beat a drum and go into a trance and people who are with them also kind of go into this trance and they visit a different world that is behind the world that we see. And the shaman kind of explains to you or guides you through his visions of this other world that he sees, which explains this world. So in Tuva, it's the spirit world, and he speaks to the spirits. And, so, and many times it's women. She speaks to, to the spirits. And that explains what's going on in the world that we see. So Feynman, I like to call him a shaman of physics because he would see images of nature. He would sort of fly around the atoms and the particles and feel them and describe what it's like to be in that quantum world. And when he gave a lecture, it was entrancing. People would, were in a trance kind of, uh, you know, listening to him talk. And he would give them the illusion of understanding. You'd leave his lecture feeling like, I understand everything. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Even my dad, who's a professor, it's like, yeah, you leave Feynman's lecture and you see everything clearly. But then 15 minutes later, you try to explain it to somebody else. You can't explain it. That was Feynman's magic, the, the way he was able to entrance an audience. Anyway, so there you are, so, sort of how it was for me to be near this shaman of physics. I see. So I guess, I mean, uh, the, this, this seminar would be like a little bit special. So we're going to make it like a, mostly like through like question and answers. So sure, let's do uh, it. Yeah. So I guess I'll start from a couple of questions I, I have kind of lead the way. And then after that, we'll open questions for the everybody uh, the, in the audience. And then if you guys have a question to ask after my questions, maybe you can just, uh, there's a, there's a op, op function that you can use on Zoom by called raise your hand, you know, you can raise your hand and then we, uh, we can see who has a question first and second. This way is we, we'll just uh, address them uh, in the order. Uh, I'll, I'll just call your name and then we, you can unmute your mic and we can do that. Does that make sense, you guys? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, may, maybe I'll, I'll get started. Uh, so as you described, you guys had been playing bango for like almost 20 years, right, together, right? So, so is this like, like pretty much like every week, like a, like a dedicated time, and then you, could, you just get together, maybe him and you and a couple of your friends together? So, yeah, it, it was rather frequent. It felt like every week or two weeks, yes. And I was actually kind of surprised he liked to do it so much. And um, I found out later that he had an African drumming partner from uh, Nigeria, uh, from the Igbo. Uh, tribe of Nigeria, but Nigeria right at that time, 68, 69, had a civil war and this guy went back to help his people. So Feynman had just lost his African drumming partner. And then he comes over to our house to talk to my dad about physics. And what does he hear? He hears in the background this drumming. And so there's these two guys, these two teenagers in the back drumming. And maybe two of us white guys equal one African guy, I don't know but, or at least to try to. But anyway, he just sat right down and started drumming with us and we really clicked. So I think it was partly because he lost his other drumming partner. I think he drummed a lot. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, did, did you guys talk about, as you said, mostly the, you guys talk about was basically recorded and then uh, put it into the books, like surely you're joking. And then uh, 
what do you care what other people think, right? The, mostly these two books, right? Uh, but, That's right. Okay. But do, do you guys talk about physics uh, as well, about like the physics he did or, or is the, besides what is in the book? Uh, well, yes, actually. And if you look, uh, you know, it might be good for you to share all the links that I sent you. I just sent you an email with this list of links. Yeah. There's one called Fun to Imagine. Uh -huh. And they're short, maybe five minute descriptions of uh -huh. things. Uh -huh. And um, I noticed that if we were walking somewhere or looked at something, he would kind of launch into one of these things to describe what's going on from the shaman's point of view. And I could see later he was kind of honing it or, or perfecting it on us dummies um, to be able to explain it to ordinary people. And then when the BBC wanted to do some shows on him, um, he was all ready to go with these descriptions of everyday things that you see right around you, like a ball bouncing. And you know, the ball, why does the ball not bounce up as high? What's going on? Because the atoms, they all bounce perfectly, but the ball's not bouncing. Well, it turns out that the ball is losing heat into the floor. And if you're Feynman, you see a series of spots on the floor that are a little bit warmer than they were before because the ball bounced on them. And, it, and the ball is warming up a little bit. I mean, that's the kind of shamanic visions that Feynman could have and then communicate to people like us. So that's the level of physics that he would do with us, is everyday things from a quantum point of view. Yeah, basically, he, he has this uh, unique ability of de demystify like a very abstract like uh, mathematical equation and physical theories into it's very intuitive pictures, right? Like colorful picture with everything like almost like vivid, like uh, active, right? So that everybody can understand it, right? Or at like, least feel at least feel like they understand but, it for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Uh, another question I have is like you mentioned that he visits your your uh, your 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 house, like basically your, with your dad, right? I know like yeah. your dad is actually uh, the co-author of Feynman Lectures. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe can you tell, tell us a little bit about like maybe uh, his relation with Feynman and uh, like as a colleague and then uh, how they did together, work together for the lectures, Feynman lectures. Okay, sure. Well, my father um, was a professor in his own right in physics, but he was kind of intimidated by Feynman, how brilliant Feynman was because he as a physicist could appreciate how brilliant Feynman was. For me, Feynman was a drummer and we were just drumming and he was just a, you know, we hang out and drum. So my dad was somewhat intimidated. But anyway, when the, when the uh, Soviet Union launched Sputnik in uh, 1957, I remember as a kid, seven years old, going up on the roof and seeing this satellite blinking, going over, it scared the beep out of everybody because everybody in the world could see this blinking light and it was like a big middle finger to the united states because it was like oh you guys think you're superior you think you can destroy us well guess what we can send a satellite right over every house in the united states no problem and all of a sudden education people were saying oh my god we're behind we have to reinvent everything so the Feynman Lectures on Physics came out of the space race. And in fact, uh, some of the lectures you'll hear about astronauts and the Soviet astronauts and orbits and gravity and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, my dad was asked by the department chairman to kind of keep an eye on Feynman because Feynman was already known as this kind of crazy guy like you saw on the drumming, you know? Ah. And the administration was worried that he might be too crazy in the lectures. And so my dad was assigned to kind of put a leash on Feynman to keep him more in, in the line. Well, the crazy thing is right now I'm going through the, the audio tapes of those lectures. And at the end of each lecture, I can hear my dad who's standing over to the side say a few 
words to find me. And by about the sixth or seventh lecture, uh, I can hear my dad say to Feynman, wow, that was fantastic. You know, we're in business now. In other words, Feynman completely swept my dad off his feet and took him leash and all, you know, into his world and essentially did the lectures the way he wanted to do. And my dad was always saying, oh, that was so great. So it didn't work to try to keep Feynman uh, contained like that. Great, great. I guess, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll ask you the last question and then I'll turn, turn it to other people. So uh, I watched the video you, 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 you uh, showed me before, like the two and or bust, the video like on YouTube. And then uh, toward the end of the video, you got a little bit emotional because Feynman died after like uh, one week of that video. And then uh, I, I know like uh, Feynman himself didn't really, uh, was not bothered much by the, that, the idea of death. And, uh, uh, and he didn't really believe in uh, religions, right? I mean, I think uh, based on my understanding. And also, I mean, but we're in this time of the COVID-19 and everybody's suddenly getting closer to face uh, death, you know? So can you maybe share uh, what do you think about like his attitude to death? I mean, I, I think you guys might talk about it, right? Like during maybe the last uh, couple months of his life or something. Uh, not really. Um, and so another link on the videos, um, it would be the second drumming one. Uh -huh. um, he, that's two weeks before he died. Mm -hmm. uh, and he still has a lot of vitality. You see, you can see how much he has aged. If you look the first drumming video and the second one, it's only four years apart. It's very clear that he's losing his color, his hair's changing and everything else. But you can still see in that second video of drumming, the spirit is still there. And I think I was in denial about the fact that death was coming. Mm -hmm. And um, so we didn't talk about it. We just drummed and it was fun. And I'm wondering whether for him, drumming and tuva were a kind of escape. You know, he had four very painful cancer surgeries. Right. Yeah. And if you, uh, and I can tell you, having undergone some, some pain myself, some physical pain, if you pick up a drum and start playing the drum, you can forget about your pain. It, it, it's just amazing what it does to your mind. And so I'm thinking that tuva and drumming was a kind of escape for him near the end of his life for the more painful periods. So no, we didn't actually talk about it. We just, he just lived fully right up to the end. One thing I do know, and, and that is that um, I went to see him in the hospital maybe two days before he died and he seemed not to be there. He was kind of, you know, eyes closed and everything else. And the doctor comes in and, and uh, says, well, yeah, it looks like, the, you know, it's, it's pretty close uh, to the end here. And uh, you just never really know what's going on in the, in the person's head, whether they can hear you or not. And so finally, it looks like he's dead, heart, you know, almost barely alive. And right after the doctor says that, he goes like that. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm listening. And then he uh, woke up, and I was not here for this, but his sister came to see him. And his last words to her, uh, made famous by her, are, I'd hate to die twice. It's so boring. <laughs> so yeah, I, there's Feynman for you. Yeah. OK, yeah, great. I mean, I, I can totally understand his attitude. Yeah. So OK, uh, I guess I'm, I'm going to uh, let other people ask questions. Well, I might ask questions in case that uh, I have we have time. But uh, do I, anybody else any question? Any question uh, for Mr. Layton? And then feel free. I think okay, we got one uh, one hand there. We got Matthew. So let me see. Uh, okay, can I, I, can you unmute yourself or I I can yeah I, I unmute myself. Uh, Thanks. Go ahead, Matthew. Go ahead. Uh, so. Um, I noticed in that um, brief bongo clip you showed um, that 
the words orange juice kept flashing at the bottom of the screen. Can you possibly explain the story behind that? Sure. Um, yeah. I, so oftentimes um, in the drumming breaks, you know, we would, we would pound the drums pretty hard. And, and in Southern California, uh, warm summer evenings, you know, we'd feel thirsty. And so I quickly learned that his preferred drink was uh, orange juice. So I always had orange juice on hand. So there's fact number one. Fact number two is that he liked to imitate languages. In fact, I saw him, I witnessed this. He, he uh, was introduced to a woman from France and all of a sudden he does, what the what's it all, who's he? And I can't do it, but he could just fake his way so well that she could hear, kind of assume things he was saying. Um, there's a story in Surely You're Joking called Man of a Thousand Tongues. He just had this way of just faking it. Anyway, so he could make up nonsense syllables and it would sound like some kind of, you know, native uh, song chant from some other part of the world. And what he liked to do, we did this at schools. We'd go to elementary schools as one of our gigs, was give concerts, drum concerts. So he would start off with all the nonsense syllables and then gradually, gradually, gradually bring it a little closer and closer and closer. And gradually, you can see the lights go on in the kids' heads throughout the audience. Oh, he's singing about orange juice because he would um, make it clearer and clearer. So by the time he's done, he's singing in English, saying, give me a little bit of orange juice. It's a juice. Juice, juice, juice. So it was that slow transition in watching the the kids catch on was a great delight when we gave those concerts. So that's that orange juice song. Okay, and you, oh, we got another hand here. Uh, go ahead, Chase. Yeah, so you, just, you know, you played drums for a while. You know, did you uh, make any songs together, or like, what were your favorite ones that you liked to play? We did make some songs together. Um, and so one thing I didn't put in was a link to a, a, a site called Bandcamp that artists use a lot, B-A-N-D-C-A-M-P. So if you uh, search Bandcamp Feynman, uh, you'll get uh, access to a number of CDs that are online that you can play. And if you look up Safe Cracker Suite, um, there are a number of uh, pieces in there that we composed specifically uh, for a ballet because we were commissioned to play uh, for a ballet that contained only drums. And so um, we, we came up with a number of uh, pieces which you can hear on that uh, CD. But there was one problem. I found out that Feynman, the great mathematician, um, and you know, calculator and all that kind of stuff did not ever count out beats and he didn't count out phrases. And the problem was we sent a tape because it was in San Francisco, we were in LA for the dancers could rehearse to. And we didn't pay any attention to how many times we repeated one thing and how many times we, we switched to another rhythm and all this stuff, we just gave him a tape. And all of a sudden we realized, oh my God, they're rehearsing to this tape. Now we have to pay attention. How many times did we do each thing? And he couldn't count while he drummed. It turned out the part of his brain that was drumming was used up and he couldn't count for that. Whereas I somehow could, you know, I could say to myself, you know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, 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 like that, you know, and I'd know how many phrases. So we developed a communication system that was visual. And we would look around the room at different corners. I would look up there. There's one, look over there, two, down there, three, over there, four. But it's just a nod of the head. We're just going like this, down there, and we know down there, that means we switch. Or however many times, we just kind of went around the room with these spots, and that's how we could figure out when to change. So that's what it was like to drum with Feynman, to find out that this great guy who knows math inside and out doesn't count when he drums. He uses a different part of his brain. 
Okay, I got, we got another question from Trey. Trey, go ahead. I threw it up in the chat because I'm not sure my mic's working very well. Oh, you, your mic works pretty well. Go ahead. All right. I was wondering, how would you compare Feynman to say, you know, Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson as far as, you know, reaching out to the public? Would it be fair to say that he paved the way for them or would you consider them not quite the same? It's a great question. Um, I, I listened to Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, podcast called Star Talk, which is a whole lot of fun. Um, Feynman sort of did it his own way. Um, he was kind of coaxed into the various programs he did. And I think the reason the BBC got all those programs was partly because his wife, um, uh, Gwyneth, was from England and they would travel to England to see her family. And the BBC did their homework uh, on things, uh, on scientific subjects. So they would catch him while he's on vacation and sit him down and talk back and forth. And, you know, they charmed him, he charmed them. So there's a number of BBC documentaries, some of which were taken over by PBS. So that's what he did. Carl Sagan, you know, actually sort of made a series. Um, so that's a step further and something more public, um, more, you know, consciously reaching out to the public. I think Feynman was, yeah, here's some stories. If you want to hear them, that's fine. But he didn't, you know... Uh, work at all to market them. For example, for example, he turned down a chance to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Couldn't believe it, but just wasn't interested. The only place he went for publicity was his local library. He gave a talk at his local library. That was it. So Sagan was more out there. And then Neil deGrasse Tyson has just, you know, updated the thing. But I would compare him pretty closely to Feynman in terms of he just got that spirit and and uh, charm and and everything so yeah i i would agree with your assessment that uh, you know Feynman in a way paved the way but these guys have gone much further i i like to add a comment to this uh from a physicist point of view i mean i don't know neil uh, degrasse tyson but i know a little bit carl sagan but i mean in terms from the professional point of view like Feynman is one of the greatest physicists you know i mean in 20th century for sure even old time, I mean, he's he's out there. You can you can compare him with a lot of other great names in physics. You know, like uh, uh, maybe Albert Einstein and Schrödinger, like uh, uh, Landau, I mean, uh, Young, and et cetera, et cetera. So he he's like he's the first class physicist. He got Nobel Prize doing theoretical physics. So he's like real true master in physics. So well, uh, well, the I mean, he he's doing this education part uh, thing as well. But I don't think he considered this as his like truly main main job. His main job, he, he probably he's still think like he's a fit, theoretical physicist, you know. He, I think he, you're 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 exactly right. Mm -hmm. And whenever he was coaxed into giving a talk about education, he would start right off by saying, I know nothing about education. I, you know, just you know, what, you know, I'm not gonna try to persuade you that that what I'm saying is right. So I, I think you're exactly right. There's that side to him. The main side was his physics. I remember uh, talking to him one time when he was over at my place and I was listening to the shortwave radio and I heard that uh, uh, the government of Zimbabwe had put somebody under house arrest mm -hmm. and the guy you know, could, 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 couldn't go out at all. He could only have people come see him at his house arrest. And I remember Feynman saying, oh, you know, house arrest. That wouldn't be so bad, you know, because <laughs> then he wouldn't have to go out <laughs> and deal with administ administrators and all this stuff. He could just do his physics, and people could come see him, and you know. So that was I was surprised, but but then I could understand that. Yeah, yeah. Do, uh, other questions? Do we have more questions? Anybody else? Raise a hand. I have a, I have another question. I'm always curious about Feynman's like a, a political like a point uh, point of view. I noticed like one of the uh, in one of the writings it says like Feynman registered as a Republican voter, but I'm not sure is he's like totally Republican or Democrat or he doesn't care, he doesn't give a shit or what is his like um, or political? I would say at. First of all, if you were Republican in the 1950s, that was a different kind of Republican. Right, exactly. Um, 
right. Uh, he was mostly apolitical, uh, would, you know, didn't participate in anything. I remember Murray Gell-Mann came one time huh. to his office. I happened to be at Feynman's office. This was in the 1980s. And there was this big attack on science because there's on evolution. Mm -hmm. And there's this doctrine called creationism. Mm -hmm. And uh, different states, for example, Texas, and I wouldn't be surprised if the state of Oklahoma was in on it as well, wanted to put into the textbook, oh, yeah, evolution is just a theory, you know, but the Bible is fact. And, and here's this whole other side. And you have to teach both sides. Mm -hmm. And Gelman was getting all these scientists, Nobel Prize winners, everybody else, signed this letter to the president and say, look, you, you can't do this. Our country's future depends on good education. And I remember Feynman just saying, nah, I don't like to get involved. And poor Gelman was just shaking his head. It's like, Richard, what's it going to take to get you involved? Science is under attack. So, and I sympathize with Gelman there, but he still didn't sign it. But there is a photo of Feynman at a protest holding a sign, the only one he ever attended. It was in the early 1960s and it said, foolishness is not a crime. Now you have to understand, what does that mean? It was that at the time, Caltech students were getting busted for smoking marijuana and he thought, it was a felony arrest. If you got busted smoking marijuana, you got a felony on your record. And even to this day, if you have a felony on your record, you can't get a whole bunch of different jobs. Right now in California, our, a lot of our fires are fought by prison labor who get very trained in fighting fires, but they got a felony on their record and they can't get hired as firefighters. So now our governor signed a law saying, oh, well, actually, you can get your felony erased if you learn to fight fires. Anyway, Feynman was there in the early 1960s at a demonstration to decriminalize marijuana. And his way of saying it, which I think maybe a lot of people didn't get, but you know, foolishness is not a crime. It's just like, you know, the guy's just smoking and have a good time. He's not hurting anybody. Why is that a crime? So he's a bit libertarian. You know, don't tell me what to do with my own life. Get out. You know, I want anything to do with you. So I bordered on libertarian, I'd say. But he did, from his mother, have a very strong sense of general responsibility, general good. And she really did teach him that kind of thing. She went to a school called the Ethical Cultures School. You can look up that. Uh, a whole doctrine of bettering society. And so he had that uh, as well, but he just didn't wear it on his sleeve. But uh, yeah, and he liked to smoke marijuana. He was up, he was smoking marijuana himself. So he held that sign up as for himself too. You know, there were headlines in the paper, by the way, Caltech professor uh, testifies in favor of uh, marijuana. I see, interesting. We got another Way question. back, way back when. Yeah, we, we, got another, sorry, we got another question from Trey. Go ahead, Trey. So Feynman was up there with, you know, the leading scientists of the world. Were there any in particular that he just didn't care for? Hmm. I think he got pretty mad at Shockley. And you may know about Shockley. You should check him out. And uh, maybe a podcast called Through Line tells about the history. This uh, character, Shockley, was brilliant in terms of inventing a transistor and electronics and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he, you know, came out pretty much defending uh, the concept of race correlated with IQ and all this stuff. And that, that got Feynman pretty upset because he felt that, you know, Shockley was giving scientists a bad name. But I think, I think Feynman would have called him an engineer. But Feynman really respected engineers, too. He, in fact, he would say engineers are honest physicists because the uh, <laughs> you know, physicists like Feynman sit around coming up with theories that are just born of curiosity, whereas engineers are trying to solve a problem and make society better. So he called them honest physicists. So I got to say, well, yeah, when Shockley started, 
you know, making publicity for some of his views on race. Uh, I remember Feynman was not happy with that. Can't think of anybody else, actually. So, yeah, that's the one that pops out of my mind. Interesting. Yeah, I, I actually, I have tons of questions myself, but uh, do you guys have, okay, I got another question from Matthew. Go ahead, Matthew. Uh, so on a personal level, did you have any favorite characteristics of his? Um, well, the drumming was sort of the core of the whole thing. And I was just so happy that he found that fun and amusing to do. Um, and so that, you know, we could spend time doing it. And the other thing is that it was in those days of, um, you know, people wanting to smoke weed and stuff. And I tried a, a, a couple times with very bad results. Um, I, I was not uh, counseled correctly. And I took a few hits and then the principal of my school called up. And while I had her on the phone, I was watching her, you know, in my mind and kind of laughing and everything. And I realized it's not very smart to be smoking and then answering the phone. So then I got the, I, I learned that when you drum, you can go into a different psychic state without any drugs. And this was just a lot of fun to do that. And so just, you know, to partake in the, in the ritual of drumming and then to hear the stories, that was just, that was just the core of the whole thing is so much fun. And uh, we did that up at Esalen where you can see that first uh, drumming tape, which was this kind of hippie enclave up on the California coast, which he loved to go to. And um, I helped him invent uh, an extra excuse to go up there uh, by creating a course called idiosyncratic thinking. So this was part of what I learned to do with him, which is to invent a game and then play it. So we invented a game that where there's gonna be this course called idiosyncratic thinking, which is basically think for yourself. And then Feynman would give a lot of examples through his stories. And that gave him an excuse to go up to this wonderful place with hot tubs overlooking the ocean and all this stuff. And then that was the prelude to inventing the game of trying to get to Tuva. It's the same kind of thing, invent a game and play it. And so that's kind of what we did. So, so I have a question, a follow-up question. Do you think, like, maybe for, from your point of view, the, the, the most, uh, like, uh, the best uh, character of Feynman maybe called, like, curiosity, as, like, his curiosity or, like, t taking adventures? Is that, is that correct? Sounds correct? Like, you would think, like, this yes. is the most significant? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, in fact, one reason he would have his classes called Physics X in which, you know, no credit, you know, just totally voluntary. It was an ask me anything class. Mm -hmm. And the caliber of the questions was not necessarily so sophisticated, but he liked that because when a student would ask a rather naive question, mm -hmm. he could always find some way to turn it into a question of curiosity, mm -hmm. something to investigate. And it would get him out of a rut of something that he was working on, some student comes in with some question and all of a sudden he's thinking along a different track about a different subject, asking more questions. So as you said, favoring questions to answers. So yes, curiosity was the bedrock of uh, his joy. Great. So do we have four, uh, more questions? Uh, I mean, time goes really fast. Right now, it's already like about five. So you, you guys have more questions. I guess we can go with a few more. Uh, I mean, I actually have a lot of other questions, but may, maybe we can talk uh, another time. But uh, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation with, with uh, Mr. Layton. And uh, let, let's all thank uh, Mr. Layton for a wonderful talk. I guess you can you guys can show some, uh, like uh, either <laughs> thumb up or... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. It's nice to remember my friend. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I guess uh, if there's no more. Oh, oh, there's another question. Trey, go ahead. So you said uh, Feynman was very apolitical. Was there you know, a lot of times that ever got him in trouble? Let's say Caltech or, you know, even at home? Um, a little bit. Uh, I remember my dad complaining 
that Feynman didn't have to do any of the administrative duties around Caltech. He didn't have to serve on any committees wow. that most professors had to do. And he'd kind of shake his head and say, that Feynman, you know, he gets away with it, you know. But he also recognized that Feynman's value to Caltech was to do as much physics as possible, you know, and to, to come up with new theories and, and everything else. And that, you know, kind of like, you know, anybody else could do the administrative stuff. So there was some resentment, but on the other hand, so many professors would run up to Feynman with, you know, their latest work and say, hey, you know, Feynman, check this out. And they'd start explaining it to him. And he'd stop for a moment. He says, wait, 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 wait a minute. I don't understand. And he'd ask them some really basic sounding question. Very, very fundamental. It's like, wait a minute, I forget. The cathode, the anode, which one is plus, which one is minus? He'd sound like he's a total idiot. And then through a couple more very basic questions, all of a sudden, this other professor would say, oh my God, I never thought of that. It's like he was kind of gently poking holes in their theory, you know, checking it from the ground up. Is it on solid foundation? So he was this kind of consultant or guru that you could go to to bounce an idea off of. So I have a feeling, you know, they would take that opportunity to do that, knowing that, well, you know, he doesn't have to be on all these committees. He can at least listen to my idea. Yeah, Trey, I would like to comment on that as well. Uh, Reed surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. He got into trouble, like, sometimes, I mean, uh, with all kind of, in all kinds of different situations. Sometimes related to politics, sometimes, uh, like, kind of a, like the social, like the social norm, you know, he's like sometimes he's a kind of away from the social norm. So this kind of get him in trouble occasionally. So yeah, that book has a lot of these kind of stories, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, he's like the, you know, the man from Mars who comes down and doesn't, doesn't know anything about how things are done on Earth because he's got this other point of view from this other plane, this other place. Yeah. But I think he also had this kind of wisdom, like he, he, it's not like he's totally ignorant of these, but he just feel like they're not very valuable. So he, he actually chose by his uh, free will to not to follow some of the orders or some of the norms because like, he feel like it's a totally bullshit. He just want to live yeah. his own way, but he definitely, he's aware of everything. He, he knows like what, I mean, all these kind of stuff. Like the, the, for example, they, uh, he, he resigned from the Academy, Na National Academy of Science, kind of, probably similar kind of a situation. But I mean, anyway, this is a, he's a really, really interesting uh, character to, to look well, at. One thing is, though, that when he did become involved, like they kind of twisted his arm to join the Challenger Commission to look right. into the Space Shuttle Challenger accident. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to do it at first. And he tried to beg off. And you'll see in the story about it, his wife convinced him, said, you know, if you're not on that commission, there's going to be 12 commissioners. They're all going to go around and they're all going to get briefed and they're all going to write a report and that's it. And they're going to put the report away. But if you're on the commission, there's going to be 11 people going around getting briefed and there's going to be one person going all over sniffing around. And if there's something rotten going on, you'll find it. And he had to admit that, yes, that's the kind of guy he is. He does stuff on his own, in his own terms. So he joined the commission. And when he did, he put the physics aside. No work. He gave up six months of his life. He said, okay, next six months, he said, I'm committing suicide for six months. So he basically had the philosophy that I've heard other people say also is like, if you know you can do something about the problem, well then do something about it. Otherwise, don't let it worry you. But if, but if there's something you can do, then do it. Yeah, I, on that line, I know that he, he refused to sign the report. I mean, a re, an initial, initial report because he felt like they didn't express his view on, on, on the uh, disaster until in the end, they agreed to add an appendix of Feynman's uh, in, individual view about this uh, about this uh, challenger, that then he signed this report. <laughs> and it turns out that the appendix is cited by many more publications than the report. I've, I've received, you know, emails from people saying, you know, the association of disaster, this and this preparedness or whatever, whatever, we are featuring Feynman's appendix F as our <laughs> subject. So, so his appendix was read 
more than the report, I'm sure. Oh, interesting, very interesting. Yeah, I guess we're running out of time. So uh, uh, let's, let's thank our speaker again and by uh, clap <laughs> or give thumbs up. Yeah, we really had a good time and uh, enjoy a lot of you know, all these kind of conversations. And uh, yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll talk again, maybe sometimes, you know, like I, you have more questions or something, but yeah, I, I, that's, uh, I'll stop recording for this today. And then